Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It is still Christmas. Christmas is not just a day, it's also a season, albeit a small one, in the church year. So today is the first and, for our purposes, only Sunday after Christmas for this year. For the service today, we're not going to be using one of the normal liturgies. Instead, we're going to be using the chorale service, which replaces a lot of the songs of the ordinary with hymns. And so you'll want to be following along in the bulletin, included also the fact that two of the hymns we're using today are not in the hymnal, so those are included in the insert. And speaking of hymns, there's a typo in the bulletin which I know shocks all of you. The first hymn is not 135, it's 133. So we'll begin with that.
holy office. I forgive your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. quench. 
he will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from prison to the, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Here ends the Old Testament reading. We now continue with the psalm. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say,
Holy Gospel for this Sunday is from the second chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, verses 13 through 23. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose, and took the child and his mother by night, and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem, and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted, because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose, and took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, that was spoken by the prophet that was that what was spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. Here ends the reading of the Holy Gospel. You may be seated for the hymn.
Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Gospel reading this morning told us about a horrible crime. King Herod, afraid of the threat he thought was posed to his rule by the toddler Jesus, ordered that all the boys two years and under in Bethlehem be killed. At Herod's command, his soldiers killed possibly dozens of small children, all because Herod cared only about himself and saw his earthly power as a way to serve himself instead of those over whom he ruled. But this was not the first time in history that God's people had been threatened by a king, even the smallest among them. The text for our meditation this morning brings us back to when God's people were, for, were enslaved in Egypt. We read in the beginning of Exodus, starting with chapter 1, verses 8 through 14. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they, made, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, and made their lives bitter with hard service, in mortar and brick, and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. For as long as the rulers of Egypt remembered Joseph, the people of Israel were fine. Joseph was the one who had saved Egypt from starvation and ruin. Joseph had guided them to store up enough food during seven years of abundant harvests so that during seven years of famine, Egypt had enough food to not only feed its own people, but also to sell it to its neighbors. Of course, it had not just been Joseph who was doing this, but God, who was working through Joseph for his divine purposes, so that along with saving Egypt, Joseph's family would also be saved. It eventually worked out that in thanks to Joseph, Pharaoh welcomed his whole family to settle in northern Egypt in the land of Goshen. While in Goshen, the people of Israel flourished. When they had moved there, there were less than a hundred of them. But in the course of three centuries, the Bible tells us that the land became filled with them, many thousands of people. And if the pharaohs of Egypt had continued to remember who these people were and why they had been welcomed to settle in Egypt, their numbers would not have mattered. But because the memory of Joseph faded and what he had gradually done, the people of Israel became less and less welcome in the hearts of the Egyptians until they were seen as a threat. There were many of them, and in their religion and culture, the Israelites were nothing like the Egyptians. So we have no choice but to admit that we can understand why the Israelites made the Egyptians feel uneasy. Like the Egyptians, we are also sinfully prone to see those who are different than we are as a threat to what we consider normal. But when we encounter those who are not like us in their culture or even in their faith, we should not automatically see these people as threats to the ongoing consistency of our lives. Instead, we should see them as God sees them, people to whom God has given physical life, people for whom Jesus gave his life on the cross to pay for their sins. This payment was made even for those who don't know about it. They don't benefit from it if they don't know, if they don't believe in Jesus. But that doesn't have to be someone's permanent state. At one point, all of us were ignorant of Christ. And how did that change? It changed when someone spoke the gospel to us. It changed when our parents brought us to the baptismal font and then kept on bringing us to church, and Sunday school, and confirmation class. Just as the pharaohs of Egypt should have never forgotten Joseph, and should have always viewed those different people up north in light of his memory. So also, we should never forget Jesus. And we should view those who live and believe differently than we do in light of Jesus, remembering two things. 
that all people can believe and be baptized and be saved. And also that God does not demand that all the members of his church have the same taste and live in exactly the same way. The Christian faith is not bound to one single culture. Even in our small congregation, we are not culturally homogenous. And neither has God's New Testament church ever been made up of people only from one nationality and culture. As St. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now because the Egyptians were threatened by the Israelites, they oppressed them. The Israelites were enslaved and forced to build Pharaoh's cities. But this did not stop the Israelites from continuing to be fruitful and multiply, and continuing to grow as a problem in the sight of their Egyptian masters. We continue in Exodus chapter 1 with verses 15 through 22. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Sifra and the other Pua, when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the, the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrew you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. So this is where Hebrew, where this is where Pharaoh threw in with King Herod. He commanded the midwives to kill all the newborn baby boys. The reason why he told them to kill the boys, but not all the babies, was because the Egyptians liked the idea of having this captive labor force. Women could do work, but they were not seen as much of a military threat as the men were. But we heard that the midwives refused to do this because they feared God. They knew that this infanticide was obviously wrong. It was murder, and they were not going to be part of it. So the midwives lied. They claimed that before they arrived to assist in the births, that the Hebrew women gave birth without them, making it so that the midwives were not able to sneakily smother the boys or kill them in some other sneaky way like Pharaoh wanted them to. We might wonder if these women were committing a second sin in the process of avoiding the first, but they weren't. Just as those Christians who hid their Jewish friends and neighbors and lied to the Nazis about it, were doing a good and righteous thing, so also it was good that the midwives said what they had to to save the life of these newborn boys. All the commandments God has given us are the same. We should not want to disobey God in breaking any of them. But not all the ways in which we are obligated to keep God's commandments are the same. In situations like this, where we will either have to break the fifth commandment that to not murder, or the Eighth Commandment, that to not lie, we will always use our words to preserve human life. And this is not just an after-the-fact human rationalization. We are told that because of their faithfulness, even though it involved a lie, God dealt well with the midwives. And in the New Testament, St. Paul also writes, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. So Pharaoh was not able to accomplish his evil purposes sneakily. The midwives refused to be his miracles for murder. But instead of abandoning this horrible idea, Pharaoh told his people to do it. Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Imagine how it must have been for expectant parents, hoping that their child was going to be a girl, not a boy, and then trying to figure out some way to conceal the birth of a son, even though the odds of being able to do so would have been very slim. But there was at least one set of parents 
who were able to save the life of their newborn son, of whom we now hear in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood off at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the Pharaoh, the daughter of Pharaoh, came down to bathe at the river while her young woman walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Humanly speaking, imagine that Moses' mother hadn't been able to hide him and eventually get him into the care of Pharaoh's daughter. Who would have been able to lead God's people out of slavery in Egypt? Humanly speaking, Imagine if Herod had been able to accomplish his goal in killing all the young boys of Bethlehem, including Jesus. The cross of salvation would have remained empty, and the tomb out of which Christ came in victory over sin and death never would have been entered. I say, humanly speaking, because none of these things happened or didn't happen only according to the will of men. Just as God's hand kept the basket that carried Moses from capsizing and brought it into the daughters of and brought it into the hands of Pharaoh's daughter. So God also guided Joseph to take Mary and Jesus out of Herod's reach before the sword fell. Now in both cases, God did not completely stop the evil from taking place. We can be sure that many young Hebrew boys did have their lives snuffed out in the Nile just as we grieve that so many of the young mothers with whom Mary would have had playdates never got to see their sons grow up, but had to bury them in coffins that were far too small. But in both cases, God did limit what evil could accomplish, and he kept his promise of deliverance from sin and death going in spite of the evil of men. Through Moses, God eventually called his people out of Egypt and gave them the land he had promised to give them. And eventually, God called his only begotten son out of Egypt to return to the land of his ancestors so that he could grow in wisdom and stature to accomplish the salvation for which his ancestors believed and hoped. There are three main things that we should take away from our text today. First of all, we should not be like Pharaoh and view those who are different than we are as a threat. We should remember that God has given life to all people and that Jesus has given his life on the cross to pay for the sins of all people. This doesn't mean that all the world's sins have been forgiven to them apart from faith, but it does mean that everyone can believe and be baptized and be made part of Jesus' death and resurrection just as happened for us. And even in the Christian church, not everyone has to be the same. Not even all of us are the same. There is such a thing as a Christian culture, as that is defined by the Bible teaching us of what the Christians should believe and do. But this Christian culture is not one that can only exist in its purest form in one time and place. Second, we should not cave into the pressure exerted on us by the world and powerful people to go against the most basic standards of human decency. Just as the Hebrew midwives feared God and refused to commit infanticide, so also we fear God, and we refuse to be part of or encourage in any way the murder of babies. And finally, 
we should all bring our past sins to God for when we have not been decent and trusting in Christ, ask him to forgive us of them. None of us have perfectly done what God demands of us. None of us have allowed our faithful fearing of God and our knowledge of his law to always guide us in our decision making. But through faith in Christ, God washes us clean. He takes away our sin and takes away their eternal consequences from us so that with clean consciences we can go out back into the world confident that no matter how poorly the world might treat us because we want to honor God with our lives, that God has and will continue to deal well with us. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please rise. praise you for sending your Son in our flesh to fulfill the law on our behalf. We thank you that although we sin much, he is our righteousness and peace. Thank you for the countless blessings you have given us this past year, for the whole of our lives, our well-being, and that you do not withhold from us your saving word. Teach us to number our days so that the blessings and distractions of this life may never turn our hearts from you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, you have been our dwelling place in every generation, but our years pass quickly. As this year draws to a close, prepare our hearts for your Son's return. Forgive the sins of this past year, those we know and those we have overlooked. Heal any divisions in our families, friendships, and in this church, and keep us faithful to Christ our Lord in the coming year, repentant of our sins, and confident in his mercy and truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Father, calm the hearts of those who look to the future with foreboding or fear, rather than confidence and hope. For all who face illness, pain, and suffering, and those to whom death draws near, give the peace that only you can give. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, Bless this land in the new year. Give us honest work, effective education, and leaders of good character. Save us from violence and discord, and bring harmony where there is division. Guide those whom you have placed in, posi in positions of power and authority to make wise decisions and establish policies and laws that serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, by your incarnation, you join divinity to humanity and humanity to divinity. Keep far from us all doubts about you, knowing that as the God-man, you have won our salvation. Give us faith in your promises and make us worthy through faith to eat and drink your body and blood for our forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the hour.
friends in Christ, in order that you may receive this holy sacrament worthily, it is good that you consider what you must now believe and do. From the words of Christ, this is my body, which is given for you. This is my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. You should believe that Jesus Christ is himself present with his body and blood as the words declare. From Christ's words for the remission of sins, you should believe that Jesus Christ bestows upon you his body and blood to confirm unto you the forgiveness of all your sins. And finally, you should do as Christ commands you when he says, Take, eat, drink of it, all of you, and do in remembrance of me. If you believe these words of Christ and do as he therein has commanded, then you have rightly examined yourselves and may worthily eat Christ's body and drink his blood for the forgiveness of all your sins also unite in giving thanks to Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for so great a gift, and should love one another with a pure heart. And thus should the whole Christian church have comfort and joy in Christ our Lord. To this end, may God the Father grant you his grace, the same our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We sing to him a preparation.
and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take heed, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. body of Christ, given for you. The Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. The blood of Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith and the life everlasting. Depart in peace.
body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given
rise. Let us pray. O oh God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.